Hi, I'm Jared Wolf, senior editor and Assyriologist here at Museum of the Bible. As senior editor, I spend my days reading every letter of every word on every text panel, every label, every brochure, and every digital table in the museum. As an Assyriologist, how old are the green ones? Uh, no, wait a minute. Uh, Assyriologist. As an Assyriologist, I study the ancient cultures of Assyria and Babylonia, two cultures that had a major impact on ancient Israel and that show up in some significant ways in the biblical text. I find those ancient stories and texts and artifacts here at the museum, and I bring my favorites to you right here on The Bible Is So. Today I want to talk to you about this brick. Now this brick is special for a number of reasons. Uh, the first being that it comes from the ancient city of Babylon, and the second being that it was commissioned during the time of the great King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, how do we know that, you might ask? Now, simple. We can all read it right here in this inscription. Let's read it together. I am Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, provider of the Asangila and the Azida, son of Nabopolassar, king of Babylon. I built the palace for my royal dwelling in the district of Ka Dingera, which is within Babylon. So, we now know who made it, we know where it was made, and what it was made for. But what else can this brick tell us? Well, let's go back to that inscription. When bricks are made in Mesopotamia, they're typically mass-produced, like bricks today. And that calls for mass-producing the stamps on them as well. So when a king mentions that he's made this brick, he has a stamp, and all the workers stamp every brick. Not this brick, though. This brick is actually handwritten, not stamped, and right here on the front of the brick. That means a couple of things. One, this took a scribe some time and was meant to be displayed. And two, as a display, this shows us how Nebuchadnezzar would have used writing, used some of these statements to beautify uh, his palace and to show its majesty, and through that, his own. There's another great thing about this brick too, moving on from the inscription. To the top of the brick, we see a thick black substance over about half of it. What's really cool is that's actually the remains of bitumen. Now bitumen is a thick tar-like, uh, naturally occurring substance that Mesopotamians and many people across the Near East would harvest and would cultivate to use for glue, adhesives, for anything really, mortar, as we can see here. You could dry it out and make toys with it or little simple instruments. Bitumen was the duct tape of the ancient world. And so here we have some preserved, and that's pretty rare in bricks. So now we can see this brick, where it was in the wall, how it had a beautiful inscription on the outside, and now we can start thinking about, well, who might have seen this brick? What was this brick's function in antiquity? This brings us to the Bible. In the Bible, we, have the, uh, we, we learn about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians uh, in the book of 2 Kings uh, and in a couple of other places. And so we might think to ourselves about in exile, would some of the Judeans have seen this brick? They certainly would, some of them would have at least certainly seen the palaces, the mighty palaces in Babylon and the huge temples, including the massive ziggurat to Marduk, the patron god of the city, which would have towered over the entire landscape of Mesopotamia. Huh? What, would, what kind of thoughts would that have generated? How would they have felt seeing this grandeur, especially knowing that a lot of it was financed by the plunder from Judea, from Jerusalem, from the temple? Well, we can actually access some of these thoughts in the Hebrew Bible. We see it in the Psalms, like the famous Psalm 137. We see it in the writings of the prophet Ezekiel, who himself went into captivity. And so when all of these things come together, this little brick here, tells us a whole story and brings a whole part of the Bible to life. And that's why, through the study of this simple mud brick, I have found that the Bible is so concrete. To learn more about the museum or plan your next visit, go to museumofthebible.org.